So when I got back uh, to Germany, I went to train at the International Interdiction Course in Stettin, Germany. It's a NATO-operated, uh, basically, special forces training. They were using 50 caliber machine guns, which is basically what was already described, almost salt shaker-sized rounds flying out of this fully automatic weapon that's accurate range is almost about 2,000 meters. Mark 19 fully automated belt-fed grenade launchers where you hold the butterfly down and grenades fly out the other end. These weapons' primary use is for basically anti-vehicle weapons. In the, our rules of engagement that we just learned a month prior, we were not supposed to use these weapons on civilian enemy. Once we got to these men, they were blown into pieces. There was no sign of any sort of weapons, any sort of anything upon them. I was told by the sergeant, scout, that we were replacing, that these men were out in their fields farming. Because the periodic electricity in their town, the pumps that irrigated their fields only operated while they had electricity, which meant to farm their fields, sometimes they had to go out into the dark, knowingly risking the curfew to farm their fields. I asked the sergeant why did he fire upon these men if he knew that they were farming in their field after he explained to me why they were there. And he told me because they were out after curfew. This is the kind of confusion that goes on every day in Iraq. Whether it's innocent civilians that we can't understand who they are or what they're doing and there's muzzle flashes and we just eliminate the enemy and they're in the way. Or, you know, whether it's men in a field that, you know, we assume are innocent anyways, but we don't even give them the benefit of the doubt, and we shoot them regardless. These things happen over and over again, and we don't have many photos of it. We don't have many stock footage of it. If we did, there'd be more Abu Ghraib scandals, and there'd be more Hadithas, and there'd be more Mike Greens that we can learn about. But all we do have is our testimonies, and hopefully with the courageous uh, efforts of Iraq Veterans Against the War, we can continue to bring these to light. The men I served with were honorable soldiers. They were professionals. They went to Iraq hoping to do good, hoping to do right. They went to Iraq to defend their country, to defend their neighbors, and defend their citizens. However, we found rapidly that that was not the case, that we were killing the Iraqi people in horrible ways, and we had to. We had to do it to protect ourselves and to operate our missions in the most safety that we could possibly do it. And most soldiers are going through this, whether they've seen a true atrocity or not. The truth of the matter is that the war is the atrocity. They waved the car off down a side street so that it would not come near our formation. As I made it up to that side street, the car had turned around and was coming back towards us because the street was blocked off by a, a concrete T barrier at the other end. So I began doing my levels of aggression. I held up my hand, getting, trying to get the car to stop. The car sped up. And I thought to myself, oh my God, this is it. This is someone who is trying to hurt us. And so instead of doing what I should have done according to policy and raising my weapon, instead I did what you should never do and I took my hands off of my weapon altogether and began jumping up and down, waving my hands back and forth, trying to get this car to stop and see me. The car kept coming. And so I raised my weapon and the car kept coming. I pulled my selector switch off of safe and the car kept coming. I was applying pressure to my trigger, getting ready to fire on the vehicle. And out of nowhere, a man came off of the side of the road, flagged the car down, and got it to pull over. He walked around to the driver's side door, opened it up, and out popped an 80-year-old woman. Come to find out, this woman was a highly respected figure in the community, and I don't have a clue what would have happened had I opened fire on this woman. I would imagine a riot. If a foreign occupying force came here to the United States and regardless of what they told us, whether they told us they were here to free us, 
to liberate us and to give us democracy, do you not think that every person that owns a shotgun would not come out of the hills and fight for their right to self-determination? But now it, it was basically we were going to be operating under the assumption that everyone was hostile. Um, he sort of wrapped up the brief by sort of going, okay, Marines, you see an individual with a weapon, what do you do? Sort of a mutter in silence for a minute waiting for someone else to answer. And some, one, one guy said, shoot him. Battalion Jagger officer said, no, shoot, shooting at a target, putting the rounds down range and suppressing a target is one thing. Setting in and killing a target is another. So again, you see an individual with a weapon, what do you do? Kill him. You see an individual with a pair of binoculars, what do you do? Kill him. You see an individual with a cell phone out, what do you do? Kill him. You see an individual who, although maybe not being actually carrying anything or displaying any specific hostile action or intent, running from, say, one building to another, or running across the street, or even running away from you, assume that he is maneuvering against you and kill him. Uh, you, you see an individual with a white flag and he does anything but approach you slowly and obey your commands, assume it's a trick and kill him. Uh, Fallujah, we went by those ROAs. Um, fighting was fairly intense for the first few days especially. Um, as under the whole recon by fire thing, we um, leveling houses before we even went in became pretty commonplace using bulldozers and tanks to do the job for us and walking the rubble. Um, on top of all the destruction that we just wrought in general, a lot of extra stuff happened too. Like if after the first few days things began, you know, to calm down incrementally and uh, we'd be holed up in houses and whatnot for, you know, a few hours to maybe a day or two and we'd get bored, we'd get angry and not be tired anymore and just be like, let's break stuff. If you're in an office and it's the morning and you're walking by maybe one of your staff sergeants and you say, good morning, staff sergeant, well, I guess the, the common response in the civilian world would be like, oh, good morning to you too. But in the Marine Corps, you get, er, kill babies. And that's motivating. That's not meant to be funny or that's meant to motivate you and, you know, start off your day with, er, kill babies. During my second combat deployment, I was deployed to the United States Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan from 2004 to 2005. So people who didn't even have licenses back in the States or know how to drive stick were now driving these vans through the crowded downtown streets of Kabul, Afghanistan at extremely high speeds, at the fastest the vehicles would go, driving in oncoming traffic, driving between the two lanes, pushing vehicles out of the way. And on one occasion, a man was killed for coming through an intersection at uh, speeding vehicles. He was hit by the vehicle. He was not shot. Our, our vehicle hit this man, and we kept driving. I, I, know, I do not know if his family received any reparations or any repayment from the U.S. government. At another time, one of the drivers without a license, uh, while going through one of the main circles in the city, hit a uh, man and his donkey on a cart. And, you know, we talk about it here, you, you take away something as simple as one vehicle or your donkey, that's an entire family's livelihood. And that, that, family, <laughs> that family could have been ruined by this small one incident. Finally, I'd like to talk about my third deployment, and that's to Iraq, again, in 2005 to 2006. We were stationed in downtown Fallujah at the mayor's compound. We had a couple of Marines that were being punished, and one of their punish punishments was to remove all this paperwork from 
the top floor of the mayor's compound and bring it down into our dumpsters while in full gear. This took hours for them to do, and I think it might have spanned it across days, actually. Well, after all the paperwork was gone, I finally had a chance to sit down with my interpreter and just ask, you know, what was all that paperwork? Well, come to find out, we destroyed all the birth certificates of the city of Fallujah. It's no surprise for anyone who's been in the military since September 11th, especially not for those of us who have been deployed since September 11th, that the word Haji is used to dehumanize people, not just of Iraq and Afghanistan, but anyone there who is not us. We bought Haji DVDs at the Haji shops from the Hajis that worked there, the KBR employees that did our laundry that were from Pakistan became Hajis. The KBR employees who worked inside of our chow halls became Hajis. Everyone that was not a U.S. force became a Haji. Not a person, not a name, but a Haji. I used to have conversations with members of my unit and I would ask them why they use that term, especially members of my unit who are people of color. It used to shock me that they would. And their answers were very similar almost always. And that was, they're just Hajis, who cares? And that came from ranks as low as mine, sergeant, all the way up to lieutenant colonel in my unit. The highest ranking officer that I ever heard use these words was the highest ranking officer at, during my deployment in Iraq, General Casey. During a briefing that my unit, the 42nd Infantry Division Rear Operations Center at Fob Spiker gave to General Casey, I heard him refer to the Iraqi people as Hajis. I have one story that I want to share with you. One of the most horrifying experiences of my tour that still stays with me there was a traffic control point shooting. Traffic control point shootings are rather common in Iraq. They happen on a near or daily basis. What happened was a vehicle was driving very quickly towards a traffic control point. A young machine gunner made the split second decision that that vehicle was a threat and in less than a minute put 200 rounds from his 50 caliber machine gun into that vehicle. That day he killed a mother, a father, and two children. The boy was age four and the daughter was age three. Now, I was in the briefing that evening when it was briefed to the general and after the officer in charge briefed it to the general in a very calm manner, Colonel Rochelle of the 42nd Infantry Division, DISCOM commander, turned in his chair to the entire division level staff and he said, and I quote, if these fucking Hajis learned to drive, this shit wouldn't happen. I looked around the talk at the other officers, at the other enlisted men, mostly higher enlisted. As a sergeant, I think I was the lowest ranking person in that room. And I didn't see one dissenting body language, one disagreeing head nod. Everyone was in agreement that it's true. If these effing Hajis learned to drive, this S wouldn't happen. I couldn't believe it, but it was true. That stayed with me the rest of my tour. I looked around every time that word Haji was used, and I thought about that soldier who will carry that with him for the rest of his life, and I thought about the four Iraqis whose bloodline was ended on that day. And Colonel Rochelle could not think of any of that, but only his own racism, and dehumanization that has started at the commander-in-chief of this war and worked its way down the entire chain of command.
Haji was the enemy. Haji was every Iraqi. He was not a person, a father, a teacher, or a worker. And it's important, we've heard this word a lot uh, during Winter Soldier, but it's important to understand where this, this word came from. And to Muslims, the uh, uh, most important thing is, is to take a pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, it's the Hajj. And someone who has taken this pilgrimage is a Haji. And it's something that in traditional Islam is, is the highest calling in the religion. So we took the best thing for a Muslim and, and made it into the worst thing. But history did not start with us. And since the creation of this country, racism has been used to justify expansion and oppression. The Native Americans were called savages. The Africans were called all sorts of things to excuse slavery. And Vietnam veterans know of, of the multitude of words used to justify that imperialist war. So Haji was the word we used. It was the word we used on this particular mission I'm going to talk about. And we've heard a lot about different raids and kicking down the doors of people's houses and, and ransacking their houses. But this mission was, was different, a different kind of raid. Uh, I never got any explanation for these orders. We were only told that this, this group of houses, five or six houses, uh, were now property of the US military. And we had to go in and make those families leave those houses. So we went to these houses and informed the families that those homes were no longer their homes. Uh, we provided them no alternative, nowhere to go, no compensation. Uh, and they are very confused and very scared and, and did not know what to do and would not leave. So we had to remove them from those houses. Uh, one family in particular, a woman with two small girls, a very elderly man and, and two middle-aged men, um, we, we dragged them from their houses and, and threw them onto the street and arrested the men because they refused to leave, uh, arrested the old man, and sent them off to prison. These detainees, there was three of them, they were in our custody for about a week. Um, over this week, these guys were beat, beaten relentlessly <clears throat> and humiliated, teased with food and water. Um, they, were, they were begging the Marines for food and water and um, the Marines would mock them. Um, throw water in their face. The detainees were flexi-cuffed um, by their wrists behind their back <clears throat> and they were blindfolded. Um, so then they, the Marines were screaming at them to get up and then they'd trip them down on their face. They couldn't break their fall because they were tied up. And um, the Marines were showing the Iraqis pornography which was strictly taboo to their religion, and they made this very obvious to us. Um, I saw a Marine take the hat off of an Iraqi. He shoved it down the back of his pants and wiped himself with it, and then tried to feed it to the Iraqi who was blindfolded. And because they were, he was desperate for food, he tr actually tried to eat it. Um, another situation, oh, well, let me get back to that. These, these guys were in our custody for about a week and I didn't see them eat the whole time. I wasn't around them 24-7. I, I don't know how long the posts were, but um, I didn't see them eat or sleep at all. Um, I remember the Marines taking this guy out to use the restroom, and I, I can't remember what the proper terminology is for the type of gown that they wear, that the men wear in Iraq, but because he was, he was flexi-cuffed, um, he was trying to squat to use the bathroom to spread open his gown, and the Marine was kicking him in the ankles. I remember his ankles were bloody and shoving him over while he was trying to use the restroom telling them that he should stand up and urinate like a man.
there's definitely, uh, looking back on it now, um, you know, at the time you get so wrapped up into everything that you, you feel like, um, you know, you just, you just want to get out there and, uh, and, you know, this one's for, you know, so-and-so who died in my platoon, and this one's for, for so-and-so, and you don't, you stop caring about who gets hurt because you're so affixed on, you know, who's been hurt in your unit, and, um, and we all just wanted uh, everyone to come home alive, and it's difficult. It's difficult when um, we're put in a situation where we're uh, experiencing pop shot and, um, you know, sniper shot and uh, IED situations in, the, in, uh, in an urban or, a, you know, civilian occupied area. Uh, I mean, it's going to be pretty ugly, especially given the weapons that we used and uh, the weapons we were given. So, uh, I mean, like I said before, you know, things definitely, things definitely degenerate over time. The problem is the occupation. Let me say that again. The problem is the occupation. Do not be contained with rules of engagement. That when your life is in danger, it does not matter what the rules of engagement are. That the problem is the occupation itself. And it's time to bring the troops home now. Thank you very much.